Una mattina mi sono svegliato Oh bella ciao, bella ciao, bella ciao, ciao, ciao Una mattina mi sono svegliato e ho trovato l'invaso Early morning to campfires, marks in a day school. Uh, my name is Claire Solomon. Uh, introduce our first speaker. This um, we have Lindsay German, and she's going to be speaking. I'm doing what is kind of an impossible task in half an hour or 35 minutes, which is try to try to locate Karl Marx in his time to try to look at some of the main events in his life and the way in which his ideas developed, and to draw a few conclusions which I think are relevant for today. So just wanted to start with a couple of photographs of Marx. Um, this is Marx, the sort of respectable Victorian gentleman, and perhaps the image that people have of Marx as this kind of man who sat in the British Museum for years writing capital, um, and as his mother say, writing about capital rather than making it, which was always a constant, uh, a constant gripe of the Marx family who didn't approve entirely of what he was doing. But this is what he was like as a young man, and this was from the late 1830s. Again, you can't see it very clearly, but very different picture of Marx. As with most of us, we look very different when we're young from when we're old, and uh, it's worth remembering that he was um, somebody who was uh, always a revolutionary and always uh, very keen on uh, ideas of revolution, as I hope I'll be able to sketch out. And that, this is one of my favourite pictures of him, which is him um, on Hampstead Heath with Frederick Engels, who was his lifelong friend and collaborator, who, uh, who was a tremendous, well, who sacrificed much of his life to make sure that Marx could write. And these were his three daughters, Laura, Eleanor and, and Jenny, his three surviving children were all daughters. He had several other children who died uh, in infancy um, and had quite a hard life in that kind of way but I don't have time to go into the details about his family which in itself is very interesting but I can recommend some things for people to read. What I want to start with is that people often talk about Marx as a genius and as somebody who had a tremendous brain, who had a tremendous ability to uh, uh, not just to write about economics, but who had a tremendous political ability throughout his life to distill the essence of what was going on in, uh, in society. When he died, um, Engels said, uh, Marx was a genius. I never had any problem playing, se playing second fiddle to Marx because um, that was a great place to be because he was, he was such a genius. He said, Marx could have done anything that I did, but there are many things that Marx did that I couldn't have done. And that was uh, the way to look at it. But one of his biographers, a man called Ryazanov, who himself was an extremely impressive Russian uh, thinker who, who wrote a book about him, round about 100 years ago, um, he says, to really determine the magnitude of a genius, one must first ascertain the antedating achievements, the degree of the intellectual development of society, the social forms into which this genius was born, and from which he drew his psychological and physical sustenance. And that was tr is true of everybody in, uh, in history, when you talk about people who play a role in terms of changing history. But of course, it was true of Marx, as it was of anybody else. And there are two things that I think we have to look at when we look at the influence that he had, or the, the influences on him that there were. The first was the French Revolution, the great uh, overthrow of the aristocracy and the monarchy in France at the end of the 18th century, and the ushering in of the ideas of, most famously, liberty, equality, and fraternity, but also the ideas of... Um, uh, change of um, uh, society which was based on ideas of democracy, on ideas um, that were very, very new and modern ideas. And Marx himself was born in 1818 in a town called Trier, uh, which is in Germany, which is in the part of Germany called the Rhineland, which was itself occupied by Napoleon after the French Revolution and was very, the area was very, very much influenced by these sorts of ideas and therefore that was something that when he grew up um, he, he knew about and his family itself, uh, originally a Jewish family, some of his ancestors were rabbis 
Um, but his father actually broke with, uh, with Judaism, but incredibly fertile intellectual background that he had, and a very liberal background compared to a lot of what was going on. So that was one thing that, uh, that influenced him uh, uh, very, very much. The other thing... Um, and, of course, the French Revolution was also part of the whole I the ideas of the Enlightenment, of rational thought, of scientific thought, all of which heavily, heavily influenced Marx. The second thing that influenced him was, of course, the Industrial Revolution, the revolution which started in this country and transformed the economy um, of this country, brought about the, the creation of an industrial working class, brought about the uh, creation of the factory system, the, uh, the growth of the big cities, most notably in Manchester. And so those were the two things that I think you can talk about influencing him. And indeed, when he became friends with Engels, one of the very important the, the things that Engels made as a contribution to his, uh, to his thinking was, of course, Engels, as, as I'll come on to later on, um, came from a, a factory-owning family again in, in Germany, in the Rhineland, but the, the, they owned a factory in Manchester, and Engels spent quite a lot of his youth and a lot of his middle age working in, uh, in Manchester in the factory, and it was there that he first came across the working class, the Chartist movement. He was in uh, the north of England just after the great general strike of 1842, so they were imbued with this sense of a new working class and, and new changes. So both of those things were very important. It's Often said of Marx, and I think it's a very fair point, that there's three different forces that formed his, his thinking in all sorts of ways. One is German philosophy, the second was English political economy, and the third was what was called French socialism. It's probably a slight exaggeration to say it was French because it also included, um, in terms of the major utopian socialists, um, it included uh, an Englishman called... Uh, Robert Owen, who many of you will no doubt have heard of, who formed the Grand National Consolidated Trade Union. The thing about the utopians was, the utopian socialists were people who Marx and Engels always admired and always <coughs> paid a debt. They said they owed them a debt in terms of uh, developing socialism. The most famous of them was Saint-Simon, Fourier and Owen himself. And Owen set up a sort of communist colony, uh, most famously in New Lanark in Scotland, where the schools were so good that the children went at the age of two and didn't want to go home, which, uh, which Engels remarked on many years later as being a kind of an odd development compared to most of the schools at the time. But they also regarded the socialism that these people developed as something which was limited in terms of its ability to transform the world. And the quotes that Engels, when he wrote many, many years later, he wrote a book, Socialism, Science, Utopian and Scientific, uh, explaining the differences between these people. He says, for the utopian, socialism is the expression of absolute truth, reason and justice, and needs only be, to be discovered to conquer the world by virtue of its own power. In other words, the utopian socialist just said, you just have to say how awful society is for people to rise up and transform it. That was one of the things that they said. They also believed that the working class was a class which was the most suffering and the most oppressed, and therefore had to be liberated, if necessary, by the, um, by the benevolent efforts of, um, of, people, of people like them. And therefore, Marx was very critical of that side, but he said that you can't just have a moral objection to it. And we see this today. There are many, many moral objections. You know, Oxfam do a, a report on great inequality and, you know, the great inequality which is growing in this country. Um, there are many, many objections from the NGOs, from all sorts of people, sometimes from people like the Occupy movement. You just state your case and then you can transform the world. Marx was critical of this view and he said... Very, very simply, he said, actually, the working class isn't a class which is, it is oppressed and it is exploited, but it is a class which also has the power in order to transform it, its situation and to bring about uh, revolution. In fact, he said the working class is the only class which can rid itself of the muck of ages, as he called it, the rottenness of capitalist society and of class society and begin to form society anew. While they were very, very favourable towards the utopians, they also believed that their immature theories, as they called them, corresponded to an early state of capitalist production. In other words, people first see the horror of capitalist production. It's only later that you then get the working class organising, the trade unions, the strikes, and all those sorts of things. And so he saw it in those kind of ways. So those 
three things were very, very formative for Marx and very, very important for Marx as he developed his ideas in the late 1830s and 18, 1840s. But then, of course, there was what was called the actuality of revolution, that you had a situation that by the late 1840s in Europe, people were suffering famine, they were suffering food shortages, there was more and more unrest and unhappiness at what, it, what was going on. And Marx and Engels were always actually part of organisation. Even in the 1850s, when they didn't really have much of an organisation, they had a kind of informal group which was known as the Marx Party. But in the 1840s, they, uh, they became connected with a group called the League of the Just, which later became called the Communist League, and Marx was asked to write the Communist Manifesto, which is perhaps, apart from the Bible, I think is the most widely sold and probably widely read book ever that there has been. And uh, although Marx missed his deadline a couple of times and there was a rather stern note from, uh, from the Communist League saying you've got to get on with doing this now, the truth is that... Uh, the Communist Manifesto came out just as Europe was erupting in revolution. There were revolutions from Naples and Sicily in the south of Italy, right through to France. Germany, their native Germany, was of course a country which immersed in revolution. So although the revolutionaries, to be perfectly honest, wouldn't have had the chance to read the Communist Manifesto. It was something that was very, very much a product of its time and a product of the, uh, of the uh, way in which, uh, in which society was developing. Now, the Communist Manifesto is a fantastic read. I would recommend anybody who hasn't read it to read it. I, there's an article that I wrote about it, which is on the recommended reading here. It goes through the... It goes through it in, a, in a funny way. When you first read it, it's quite enthusiastic about capitalism because it sees capitalism as destroying all the old ways of organising, all the old religions and the old feudal order and all the aristocracy and all this kind of thing. But then, of course, it believes that capitalism will destroy the old order, and this is why it's so keen on the 1848 revolutions, but then will rapidly itself be superseded by an organised working class which will establish socialism and then communism. This is uh, effectively what the Communist Manifesto, uh, uh, Communist Manifesto says. One of its most famous quotes is this, all fixed, fast-frozen relations with their chain of ancient and venerable prejudices are swept away. All, all that is solid melts into air, all that is holy is profane, and man is at last compelled to face with sober sense his real conditions of life and his real conditions, his real relations with his kind. Now, what that says is that all the old established ideas begin to break down. All the social order, all the things that you take for granted begin to break down. Now, one of the great um, tragedies of Marx's life was that the 1848 revolutions were not successful. In, uh, in France, they were um, perhaps the most the most heroic of them and the most extensive of them, they were eventually drowned in blood because the new bourgeoisie, the new capitalist class, would rather, in the end of the day, stick with the existing order than allow the working class, which was emerging onto the stage, to take a leading role. And this is something that is repeated around the whole of Europe, that in the end, the, and particularly in Germany, is very, very critical of the, um, of the revolutionaries. Marx himself was a... Um, edited a, a paper, I've got a, you, well, you may be able to see it as well as the slides, called the Neue Rheinische Zeitung, which he edited in Cologne during uh, 1848, which was um, where he and uh, Engels were based, which was, it was called the Organ of the Democracy. They regarded themselves as on the extreme left wing of this democratic revolution, which then they hoped would lead to a workers' revolution. Um, the German poet Heinrich Heine said... Um, about this period, he said of the working class, the hangman is waiting at the door. Um, in other words, the working class is waiting to take over from the bourgeoisie. And as one of the scholars of Marx, a man called Hal Draper, whose books are very well worth reading on, uh, on these topics, said, um, the hangman was waiting at the door, so the bourgeoisie shut the door and didn't let it in. And uh, therefore, it took a lot longer for the changes that he thought would come about to actually, um, to actually come about. Now, the point about 1848, and again, here's a quote from Lenin about this, 
is that this was absolutely formative in Marx and Engels' mind. I mean, if you've lived through a revolution or anything closely approaching it, it's something that always um, stays with you. And indeed, when the Russians made their revolution in 1917, they always referred back, actually, not to this revolution, but to the French Revolution, which was the previous most successful one, and talked about what Robespierre would have done. Marx and Engels always referred all the subsequent things that they did and how they judged things was always done on the basis of uh, 1848. Now, after that, there was a very long period of reaction and defeat. And this is when Marx came to London. He lived in London for the rest of his life. Um, he was an exile. He was a political exile, as was Engels, who, um, as I say, made a great sacrifice of his life by going to work in the family firm in Manchester, which he detested. And he didn't detest Manchester. He detested the, the firm and uh, did that for the, well, for the next 20 years. And he supported Marx. You know, you get all these stories. If you read their letters of, um, it's Christmas, we've got no money, we can't pay the, any, any of the tradesmen and all this kind of thing. And Engels will send a case of champagne and claret to the Marx family. In 1859, they couldn't even afford a Christmas tree, but they did get the champagne from Engels. Sometimes Marx would say, can you send me some money? And the way it was done in those days, they used to have these big bank notes, and they used to cut them in half and put one in one letter and one in another, and then you'd take it to the bank. So Engels would say, half of it is with you now, and the next half will be coming tomorrow. So he, he financed Marx and his family. He, he, he was like a second father to Marx's daughters. He was a tremendous man. And they tried to keep uh, abreast of what was going on politically, which was very, very difficult. In the 1850s, the Chartists, who were the great revolutionary movement up to, or sections of them up to 1848, still kept going, but essentially it was a very hard time. And it was only, I don't, there were a few times, Marx did demonstrate over Sunday closing when they were threatening to shut the shops on Sunday, which is when the working class, um, they got paid Saturday night, which is when they shopped. And, um, nearly got arrested, but didn't, because he was quite sort of bad-tempered, I think, on these, kind of, uh, on these kind of things. But by the 1860s, the beginning of the 1860s, you began to see a change again. And I can only, again, do this in very, very quick um, succession, but there were lots of changes taking place as a result of capitalist development. America and Russia, just two. Marx says in 1860, the most momentous thing happening in the world today is the slave movement. On the one hand, in America, started by the death of Brown, and in Russia, on the other. Now, these were two, and I'm sure you'll be familiar in general with both of them. One was the beginning of the American Civil War, the great struggle of the North versus the South, when, um, which became a struggle. It didn't start off as a struggle for the abolition of slavery, but became a struggle for the abolition of slavery. And Marx and Engels were absolutely enthusiastic um, supporters of the North. Absolutely. They, they, they um, did everything that they could. They, Marx wrote many articles um, for the New York Tribune, um, which at first Engels wrote many of them because his English wasn't good enough, but later he, he wrote them himself. But many about the American, uh, the American Civil War. And they were absolutely furious at first because the North, they thought, was so absolutely feeble at conducting this war. And in particular, there was a general called McClellan who was, uh, used to take his troops home every night to Washington. And they got absolutely, yeah, they'd be going, oh, they're never going to win this war, they're never going to win this war. And Engels was a great expert on military. He was called the general, was his nickname by the Marx family. He was a great uh, expert on all this. And they were constantly very, very enthusiastic about the, uh, the, the end of slavery in the United States. The same in Russia, where in 1861 you had the emancipation of the serfs, um, the peasants who'd been tied to uh, particular employers on the land. So both of those they saw as very important. Two other things it's worth mentioning. They supported the, um, the right of the Polish to independence, which was one of the great struggles of the 19th century against Russia. And they supported the proclamation on Poland in 1863. And they also were, again, huge enthusiasts for the Fenian Irish nationalist struggle. Marx was very critical of the Fenians when they blew up a prison quite near here and killed in Clerkenwell and killed loads of people. But he was very much in support of the Irish struggle. And his youngest daughter was called herself a Fenian and wore green and uh, was a great uh, was a great fan of them. Engels himself he, he had two relationships um, first with Mary Burns. Uh, 
and then with her sister Lizzie Burns after Mary died. And uh, they were both great enthusiasts for, um, for the Irish... Um, for the Irish struggle. So this was very, very much part of it, which is worth knowing because, you know, Marx is always seen as this sort of dry writer who did write Capital at exactly this period, and the first volume finished in 1867, um, but who was, was actually somebody who was very much immersed in the real struggles of people, national struggles and so on, um, and that had an effect on him. Now, one of the big effects it had was that the, he helped with the establishment of what was, became known as the First International, as opposed to the Second International, which was the Socialist International, set up by, among others, Marx's daughter um, in the late 1880s, and the Third International, which was set up as a result of the Russian Revolution. The First International, Algus Nimtz, who wrote this very, very good book, says... Um, this was the first truly international proletarian organisation. It was the first attempt. There have been a whole number of strikes going on, particularly in the building trades in London, because I think London then must have been a bit like it is now. They were knocking down everything, building things, people were making loads of profits, and the builders started to get organised and uh, see the way to, um, see the way to uh, uh, begin to go on strike. And what the... The first international was, it was the International Working Men's Association. I'm sorry about the references to men. It is one of the things, unfortunately, all the time that you have to deal with in the, in the 19th century. Um, but uh, that is what it was called. It was formed 28th of September 1864, formed of different international organisations um, from France, Italy, Germany and so on, but also from a section of people in Britain which included Marx himself and included a number of the trade union leaders, some of whom have been involved in these strikes um, beforehand. And um, the, uh, the trade union leaders obviously had very different politics from Marx. Um, and Marx, right, Marx very quickly became the kind of leading organising figure in the First International, which is, again, very counterintuitive for the people who say this is, you know, he was just a theoretician and he just wrote things and he wasn't interested in any of these things. He did, he absolutely struggled to build this organisation because he saw the need for international organisation of the working class. He didn't believe you, he believed the working class had to organise, he didn't believe you could do it on the basis of one country, and therefore it was very important, this international um, organisation. And uh, he became really its political leader. He, it was, I suppose, the equivalent of what we would now call a united front. It was a campaign which involved people with quite different political perspectives, quite different points of view, um, where they, uh, they came together over specific uh, issues. And Marx writes to Engels at various points. I can't put it quite like I want to in terms of revolution because there are all sorts of different people who've got different views here, but the key thing is getting them all organised and all fighting back. And that was how he, he saw it. The victory of, um, of uh, the American North in the Civil War, he thought, gave an impetus to democracy, uh, in Europe and changed Europe because you had this um, country which had made this great leap forward. And that was true in the late 1860s leading up to 1870. Um, you then have a, a war in 1870 between France and Germany, um, which is just unified under a man called, or is just unified under a man called uh, Bismarck. Um, well, he's the architect of it under the, the Prussian monarchy, but he's the um, architect of it. And then you have um, the siege of Paris, where Marx's middle daughter, Laura, was married to a Frenchman, as indeed um, two of his daughters were married to Frenchmen, um, was living in Paris when the siege of Paris uh, happened. Um, the outcome of the defeat of France eventually in 1871 was the establishment of the first workers' government, what was called the Paris Commune, uh, the beginning, the first real democratic uh, form of, uh, of state, which was uh, fantastically important. But his daughter, Jenny, said that during the whole time of the Paris Commune, which was from March to the end of May 1871, Marx and Engels would go for long walks and they were very, very worried. And they were very, very worried for a number of reasons. They were very worried politically 
because of um, what had happened, um, and they wanted this working, this democratic government, this workers' government to succeed. Um, but they were also worried because they had so many family and friends and old comrades who were involved in the fighting, many of them like a man called Gustave Florence who died um, as a communard whose body was thrown on a dust car as happened to the communards in the terrible um, attacks uh, that happened in May 1871. And Jenny Marks writes, the mother this is this time, you can't have any idea... You can't have an idea of how much my husband, the girls, and all of us have suffered because of the French events. They're sitting there all the time. What's happened to people? What's going on? And indeed, just after the uh, uh, fall of the Commune, um, Laura, the middle daughter, and her husband had, had gone to Bordeaux, had managed to get away from um, Paris. And Jenny and Eleanor, when Eleanor was only 16, went to... Uh, uh, visit them and the baby was ill and the baby died, um, their young baby and they ended up got crossing to Spain, then Jenny and uh, Eleanor went back to France where they were arrested and interrogated for many, many hours and it turned out after Jenny died Engels wrote an obituary which said that Jenny actually had a letter in her bag from Gustave Florence and one from a Donovan Rosser who was a uh, Irish nationalist as well. Had either of them been found, these two girls would have been deported to um, one of the, you know, to a penal colony if that if they had been found. So they were quite brave and it was quite a dangerous thing for them to do. The Paris Commune itself was uh, drowned in blood. You can go to the Père Lachaise Cemetery in Paris and you can see where they lined people up against the wall and, uh, and shot them. Um, Marx drew the conclusion, he wrote a book which made him quite famous, actually, The Civil War in France, where he describes what happened with the Commune. Um, and he says there, the working class cannot simply lay hold of the ready-made state machinery and wield it for their own purpose. In other words, he understood then, perhaps finally, I'm not sure he, he was absolutely clear about this in terms of previously, in terms of countries like Britain, but he understood then that working class power has to destroy the old state machine, if it is to be successful in, in creating a democratic revolution. So that was his lesson from the Commune. Um, and it was a lesson, as I say, that was this, this became a very, very popular pamphlet and uh, spread all over Europe and uh, the United States and made him quite a... Quite, well, he was already quite a well-known figure, but made him quite a well-known figure. London was absolutely full of exiles uh, from the Commune one of whom became engaged to Eleanor, which was a man called Lissa Gray, who was very famous, who wrote a book about the commune and who was a very famous, very brave fighter who defended his area to the last um, and managed to escape. Marx very much disapproved of, um, of the engagement and it didn't actually, uh, it never actually led to marriage, but he, he knew the communards and worked with the communards uh, for the rest of his life. He had around another 10 years of life. He was increasingly ill. He suffered quite a few illnesses. He smoked very heavily. And, but he was ill with all sorts of other things. And uh, increasingly, his, his life was, was hard personally. Um, he tried to finish the other two volumes of Capital, but didn't succeed. And they were finished after his, after his death by Engels, among, uh, among others. And Eleanor, as well, saw it as her job to, to help with that. He died in um, 1883. Before he died, he lost both his wife, Jenny, who he'd been married to for a very, very long time, and who he, he was obviously very, very attached to. And he lost his oldest daughter, Jenny, as well. She died at a young age. And both of those were a tremendous blow to somebody who was already ill. His funeral took place. There were about 15 people went to it. You can now go and see this great grave in in Highgate Cemetery, which you have to pay to get into and all this. Actually, the Marx daughters refused for him to have a monument. They didn't want any of this thing. Uh, a year after he died, there was a demonstration, which, which was about May Day, I think, but which many, many people joined as a commemoration of Marx's life as well. And they thought this was exact. They thought his work and his legacy should be a living revolutionary movement rather than a monument of, of stone. When he died, Engels said at the funeral, he was above all else a revolutionary. And that was true the whole of his life. That, you know, that I, today it's very much, well, I don't know how popular he is in academic circles. I noticed that the philosophy department in Cambridge is putting him as an option rather than a sort of, you know, in your third year, rather than uh, giving it a proper place to study. 
But he's, you know, regarded now, perhaps people look at it as, as a school of thought, a theory. It was a, it was a theory, and we're going to hear about that hopefully in the course of the day, but it was a theory based on activity, based on the transformation of society, based on the ability of the working class to transform society. And to that end, as I say, he was always part of an organisation, part of be getting together, whether it's the Communist League, whether it was the International Working Men's Association, or whether it was the Communards, a group of people who organised in order to change the world. It's very important to have a national overthrow of colonies and all these sorts of things, but you have to take it much, much further. And therefore, what tends to happen where that doesn't happen is the working class loses out. And that is what happened, particularly with the divisions in the American South, which uh, the new film I haven't seen yet, Selma, about the 1960s, tells you that 100 years after that, where you still had the most overt racism and discrimination. And, and the same is true in all these sorts of things. In any economic crisis or any other great political crisis, they will try to scapegoat different groups of people, particularly so-called minorities or, or people who are regarded as different. And I think for our purposes today, we're seeing a great deal of this going on. You know, the difference between people who are Muslims and non-Muslims, the difference between people who are um, on benefits or hard-working families. You know, there's all these different things going on. And of course, Marx and Engels um, were always very, very much opposed to that kind of scapegoating. And Marx himself was, uh, was somebody who was very concerned about some of these issues. In, in those days, as I said, Ireland was the major. The racism towards, uh, towards the Irish was, I'm not saying it doesn't exist now, but it was, it was much, much stronger and much more the main racism. But Jews, that came after Marx's death in this country, that you had a lot of scapegoating at the beginning of the 20th century and afterwards, but that Marx himself and Engels were very, very sensitive to the question of women's oppression. Uh, they wrote about it in the Communist Manifesto and the way in which the capitalist family oppresses all the members of it. Engels, when he wrote about Fourier, the utopian socialist, says Fourier was the first person to say that you can judge a society by the position of women in that society. So they, you know, they recognised that. And towards the end of his life, Marx did lots of work on looking at the origins of women's oppression. Now, Engels wrote a, a famous book around the time that Marx died to the origin of the family, private property in the state. But this was something they were very, very concerned with. So I think it's a sort of mixture of things. I think you have to say, OK, 19th century, there's all sorts of things that, that many of us would now find unacceptable or, or strange that people thought that. But I, compared with most 19th century men, I think they had a fantastic, fantastically good attitude to this question. What they would have said, it's not a question of whether they're workers or not, it's whether they're capable of distilling the experience of working class people, the essence of capitalism and all this kind of thing, into a series of theories which actually can be part of developing a working class practice and the working class theory. And that is, I think, what they did. And that's why, particularly with Engels, who lived a lot longer than, uh, uh, than Marx, in, in the later years of his life, he actually did, because Eleanor Marx was very involved in the new unions in the East End of London. She was a very great uh, trade union organiser, actually, and had no problem being a woman and, uh, and being herself an intellectual and, and middle class. Uh, Engels himself knew a lot of the trade union leaders, knew a lot of the activists, and regarded them as very, very important people. So I think, um, I, I think you know, we have to look at it in that kind of way. The question that's been said about the role of the intellectual, if you're talking about intellectuals in bourgeois society, I think it's absolutely right, you know, that Marx didn't particularly respect them. He had massive polemics. A lot of his books are, I mean, if you look at something like The German Ideology, which is one of his earlier books, I mean, which I think is a fantastically good book, although, but I think there can be a role for intellectuals in working class organisation, and that is because Marx's theory is, if you like, the, the distilled experience of working class activity. It is about, you know, you find out through the Paris Commune that you cannot take control of the state and use it for your own purposes without destroying the old order. You find out um, the failure of the bourgeois revolutions, all those things. So I think it's very, very important. Marx's view of, of societies in the colonies, the colonies were still at that time. I mean, you had obviously <coughs> India was very, very important. And he talked about the destruction of the cotton industry in India by capitalist production, effectively. But it's only really the period after Marx's death that you get the big expansion of imperialism and the, you know, the modern colonial system, the scramble for Africa, or, or towards very much the end of his death, uh, end of his life. So he didn't really, 
um, write so much as that. But he, you know, he did have the view that one country shouldn't oppress another. And of the oldest colony of, of Britain, he made absolutely clear that point. A, you know, the, a working class which, which supports the oppression of Ireland cannot be a working class which can liberate itself. You know, that was his, it was his, his constant uh, feeling about it. On the question of Scottish independence, I think, you know, I support Scottish independence, not mainly because I think it's a colonial power. If you look at Scotland's role historically, it developed a bourgeoisie, a capitalist class, which was very much part of the British bourgeoisie. That's what the Act of Union was all about and played a full role in it. Is it the Scots decide that they want independence because it's about really building a better society and that's what the referendum and the discussion around it was about then actually I think they have the right to do so and if they don't want to be ruled by David Cameron and the Queen well hey you, you can't really <laughs> criticise that can you in any in any sorts of ways so anyway I think the point about Marx being argumentative and disputatious was true but I also think that he was capable of working with people uh, when he felt it necessary as in 1848 in Cologne as with the International Working Men's Association uh, and and so on. What happened to Marx's descendants? Well, he didn't have that many descendants actually, because um, both Eleanor and and Laura didn't have children. Jenny had uh, a son, Jean Longway. She was married to a French socialist as well, who actually supported the First World War in 1914. So he didn't kind of. I don't know what hap- what's happened more recently with that sort of um, wing of the family, but that certainly was was the case. And very, very sadly, both <coughs> both the daughters, both Laura and Eleanor, committed suicide at various points. of Laura, alongside with her husband, Paul Lafargue, and um, Eleanor at the end of the 19th century. So there's not a lot of that. The point about Marx having a son by by Helene de Muth, who was the made in the in the household as far as i know is true i mean it was something that nobody really knew about for for most of marx's life eleanor marx in particular thought that freddie demuth the son who um, who became a member of the train drivers union and was actually a train driver so he actually was a worker um and lived in hackney she believed that engels was the father engels said on his deathbed told her told her that marx was the father and engels the freddie demuth as i say i mean he he did have a wife i don't know um again about his um about his descendants but i think the thing about this in a way is that you know, and Francis Wien writes about it's very nice. I'm, I'm not a huge fan of Francis Wien's book, but he does write. He goes through all the letters and says it says something terrible happened around about the time when Helene de Muth got pregnant, and Jenny Marx goes back to Germany, and there's obviously a huge carry on in the household, and it's you know it's not very very easily resolved. I think, and it's worth saying with Helene de Muth. I mean, she's talked about as the maid, and indeed she was a servant in the household. She'd been Jenny Marx's servant when she was young in in Germany. But Helene de Muth was also buried in Marx's grave along with uh, Jenny Marx and with um, the grandson who died uh, just after that. And she was also she lived in Engels's house, and they would. You know, she was a socialist. She was she was part of the household. So I think again, you know, it's always done as a sort of slur. You know, Marx did this, that, and the other. I think it's worth looking. at These were people who were human beings. They did make mistakes. They don't think it actually alters the the kind of the kind of way that we should uh, we should appreciate what Marx did contribute. I read um, more from Lindsay. Lindsay has written a number of books, um, Sex, Class and Socialism, um, Women in War and uh, A People's History of London, um, collaboration with um, John Rees there. Um, I should have said at the beginning, Lindsay's also a teacher and a, the convener of the Stop the War Coalition. So fantastically titled, if I were Prime Minister, I'd order the arrest of Tony Blair for war crime. So uh, excellent. <laughs> Portami via! Oh bella ciao, bella ciao, bella ciao, ciao, ciao! Partigiano! Portami via! Perché mi sento di morir! E se io muoio da partigiano! Oh bella ciao, bella ciao, bella ciao, ciao, ciao! E se io muoio da partigiano! 